Welcome to the Spotlight On series, where we get to sit down and speak to some of the most inspirational market leaders from some of the UK's most exciting brands. We'll learn about their careers, their challenges, and their achievements, all to inspire you to help you grow your careers. Welcome, John, to the Spotlight On series. This is a really exciting one, because uh, to have you on the show is, is, is pretty cool. Can we start off by maybe talking a little bit about your current role? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a really, it's a really varied role, right? So it's, you know, it's Ferrero, it's direct to consumer, which is a little bit different as a business model within what they do. Uh, you know, it covers five key areas fundamentally. So it covers, of course, the commercial element. So anything, you know, pricing or promotional or, pro or product related, absolutely that. But then it also covers the marketing side of things as well, which is where my background is, is from. So it covers you know, digital performance marketing in particular. And it covers anything technical that goes alongside those two things. So running the website, running um, all of the split testing, all of the different tools that we need from end down back end to, to run a, 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 an online business. And then it also covers fulfillment, so picking, packing, in our case, personalizing and shipping out product. And it covers um, kind of customer care as well, kind of as two additional parts. And all of those things mean really that it's a hyper varied role. It's probably the most varied role that I've done um, in, in you know, the last 15, 20 years. And it's definitely one of those that every day is a little bit different. There's some commonalities, but every day is definitely a, a different element as well. Yeah, cool. So you, you mentioned you sort of started your career a little bit more on the, the performance side of stuff. Like how much of a, uh, of a challenge was it or how much of a shift in mentality was it to, to start to pick up those, those wider responsibilities? Yeah, a shift for sure. It, it's come in phases really. So when you start with a marketing background, then I think most modern, especially de digital marketeers, they always have that eye on return on investment, you know, be it kind of direct sales or be it kind of lead acquisition or something similar. So that made it a little bit smoother moving into a, an e-commerce and commercial world, which you know I've done before Ferrero, but kind of is, is really dialed up at Ferrero. And so kind of adding the commercial bits in, adding the technical bits in, they're relatively similar because again, most digital marketeers are gonna have some knowledge of technical, some knowledge of the commercial. The fulfillment side and the shopper support and the customer care sides, a little bit more different because of course then you go from talking about talking to consumers and talking to shoppers all of a sudden through to talking about boxes and talking about you know operations and automation and load notes and thickness of cardboard and things like that which is a very different different world to where I've been you know previously and then shopper support kind of rounds all that off because everything that any marketeer is is doing is thinking about the shopper thinking about the consumer or the, the company that they're trying to sell to or pitch to. And so again, that feels quite natural, but there's definitely parts, fulfillment is probably the one that stands out as being a little bit different, that over time, um, you know, you get used to it, and then all of a sudden, you're talking to packaging teams about you know, different covergates, and, and it feels natural, but it's definitely an evolution. I guess as you're pushing more into, or sort of as you have previously pushed more into the de digital leadership role, like how do you find the conversations are, are, are changing? Like presumably you're now talking to chief execs, you're talking to uh, directors, you're talking to sort of like some pretty well established people within a, a large organisation who perhaps are not quite as interested in the detail and, and yeah. are you having to bridge the gap? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, digital in you know, any established organisation, there's going to be a, an incubation stage and there's going to be kind of an educational phase of, of that as well, being part of a business. I kind of describe it as educating and informing at the same time. So, you know, if I was talking to um, kind of peers, I'd be talking about, you know, return on investment on organic or return on investment on a, a channel or a campaign. When you're talking to more senior stakeholders, I think the, the one big takeaway for me is saying less can be saying more but then also but then also educating on what is meant by certain things so if there's a really important kpi such as organic traffic growth um you know senior stakeholders aren't necessarily going to understand what organic traffic growth means and so really educating the journey often from the shopper's perspective should be added because everybody's a shopper so they all get kind of user journeys educating what we're talking about and then the fact that the metric's gone from you know 20 percent to 30 percent or whatever it may be it then starts to make it tangible but i think without that education 
it can be a little bit number overload, don't really know what they mean, and so switch off or you know, not, not interested. With more of your time shifting into having to have different types of conversations as your, your remit sort of becomes quite varied, how, how are you making sure you're staying relevant and that your digital strategies that are happening across multiple brands are still innovative and going to cut through everything? Like, what, what, what's your method to, to keep on top? Yeah, I think there's, there's definitely, you know, there's, there's no shame in saying that following competitors is, is a good thing. Um, you know, you can call them competitors or other people that play the same game, right? So you can play the same game, you play it by different rules, and there's loads of books that kind of talk about that. So following competitor sets for sure is is something that's that's worth doing. I think then having a really solid team around you um, is you know essential. Probably the number one thing that you need as a digital leader is to make sure that you're getting information from other people. And if you're the most intelligent and most up to date person in the room, you're doing something wrong. Right? As as a digital leader, you need people around you who are telling you that. And the analogy that I use all the time is you know the US president, for example. He doesn't need to necessarily be you know, an expert and up to, the, up to the minute with the economy, the, you know, the budget, the war, the, all those different things, but he definitely needs a team around him who are able to provide him that information to allow them to make critical decisions. And, and something that Jeff Bezos talks a lot about is having a team around them that are empowered to make their own decisions and then feeding information so that he makes one to two to three key decisions a day. If he's making 10, 15, 20 decisions, he's got too much information, so the quality of those decisions drops. So having a team, making sure that you're, you're doing all of those good things is, is critical, and then taking a step back. Right? So there's competitors, yes, getting really involved in what they're doing, having a team, but then getting, taking a step back as well and just saying, what have we done and what's that journey been like? So look back, but then look, let's look forward as well, talking to industry experts across all the different fields that's, that's already been touched on, I think is really key to almost planning out what the next five, 10 year, you know, 25 year plan looks like. And you know, your guess is probably as good as mine in terms of what the next 10 years looks like, never mind 25. But having that trajectory, knowing what you want to achieve through an objective and then through some key results and an objective, I think is really key. So mo moving from, potentially moving from KPIs to OKRs, I think is, is something that, that we're trying to embrace as well. Um, and that really kind of allows you to point in the right, the right direction, albeit you don't quite know what that road looks like. What can you recommend to, to sort of perhaps people who want to follow that career path, who are out looking for those um, to be those strategic advisors to you? Like, what, what can they work on? What can they learn so that they are more employable to someone such as yourself? I think there's, there's two things, right? And, and whenever we talk recruiting, we talk skill and we talk will. And, and I think the skill is something that comes over time. The more you, you're involved, the more different companies you're working for, the, the higher up those relevant ladders you are, then the skill will come and the skill will build. My biggest single piece of advice would be to really concentrate on the will factors, which everybody takes for granted, I think. And there's a number of things within will. There is absolutely, you know, the whole fail fast mantra and, and kind of learning from those failings. But actually some of my biggest kind of skill improvements have come from failing, realising that you fail. Failed's a really kind of, I don't like the word, right? Failing is, what is failing? Um, but kind of doing something that could have been improved upon, learning how to improve upon it and then, and then improving upon it. I think that's, critical. The other ones definitely, I think there's a big th piece for me in behaving for the job that you want, not the job that you're in. And this is advice that I give, you know, I've, I've mentored a fair few people now and I always say to them, don't behave for the job that you're in today and expect a promotion, right? So you've got to already behave for that next job that, you, that you're looking for. And then when somebody's making a decision on whether to recruit you or not, it's a no brainer because that behavior is already there. You've already behaving or even doing the job sometimes and there's always this tension right between people doing their boss's role and and the role kind of you know I'm already doing it so why aren't you paying me for it that's always the the commentary it's not how it works in business <laughs> unfortunately it's not how it works you know I've got enough experience to know that so behaving for that role and sometimes taking on and taking that leap of faith and doing that doing that next level of skill 
hopefully under the kind of under the, the watchful eye and, and under the support of the, the next level up means that you've got that safety net, right? And you can learn a lot doing that. That will naturally build the will up, right? So, so yes, the skill, uh, that will naturally build the skill up. So yes, the, the skill is really important. That comes by succeeding and by failing. Okay. Um, but then importantly, being really confident in making those moves and, and pushing yourself, I think is what I would look for in anyone that's, that's working in my team. Obviously, it's uh, an awesome position you're in at the moment. It's, it's, it's probably quite enviable for a lot of people in the dig digital space to, to work up to something like that. So let's look back a little bit. Yeah. So how did you first get into digital? What, what kind of drew you into the industry? Yeah, I'm going to show my age. <laughs> um, I started, I can't remember exactly when it was, 2001, I think it would have been, around the time that MySpace launched. MySpace, people yeah. are probably going, what's MySpace? Um, so, you know, MySpace launches and everyone floods to it. And it's, you know, it's the, I don't know, the TikTok of the Facebook of, of yesteryear. And I started just playing around with it. I started, you know, probably, you know, not knowing really what I was doing or why I was doing it. But at the time, you'd produce an image in Photoshop and you'd slice it and you'd stick that on a MySpace page and create this website, basically based on the, the MySpace platform. That ignited the fire, I would say. That ignited the initial fire. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I went to university and it was something to do with computing and I'll never forget the conversation when I went to, to university and some you know looking for courses and somebody said software engineering is going to pay your highest pay your highest kind of salary and I'm like that'll do then um, and it was relatively computery um, so you kind of get into that and then you go through one two you know years of university and you know okay maybe I'd tweak what I was doing slightly I was really fortunate in that I ended up going to a placement over in, in um, Loughborough and had an incredible mentor whilst I was there and it was an e-commerce business, 12 months selling scientific equipment, um, so in the B2B space, a little bit B2C as well, and just learn a huge amount, not only about e-commerce, but more importantly, what I wanted to do. And so I came out of that year on, on placement, being paid as well, by the way, not a lot, but being paid <laughs> something, first take home paycheck, and wow. Um, and kind of went, right, how do I tailor all of that into a final year and then ended up kind of adding modules in, doing business, doing marketing, a dissertation that usually gets some flexibility around. And so really flex that towards, um, at the time, again, show my age, mobile marketing. It was the first year of the App Store launching. Brilliant. Yeah. And it was like an iframe in, like, of a website, but it was like, okay, great, you know, early day apps. Um, and ended up selling that back to a business in, in Nottingham as well. So again, another kind of cash reward, you know, very tangible cash reward. And then just ended up, you know, as a result of that, knew that it was definitely then the digital space, but marketing in particular. And so did, um, you know, five, six, seven years in different, different places, moving quite quickly between businesses, you know, kind of 12, 18, 24 months between businesses. And at the time, it was like, wow, this is very quick. But now looking back on it, that was fundamental because it was gathering that kind of cross-functional experience across different businesses, selling everything from, you know, single solar panels on, on, top, of, on top of houses all the way through to multi-million pound wind turbine software engineering solutions, all the way through to, you know, technology for gearboxes and running their websites, running... UK or local or international websites and the digital marketing that went along that, doing a lot of the legwork in the early days because it was, you know, it went from one man band all the way up to big team. Had some people that were coming in and was kind of starting to get into the mentorship position and then moved to what was at the time Thornton's. Um, and that was, gosh, nine years ago now. So yeah. moved to Thornton's, did a load of their stuff, you know, kind of, yeah, exactly, moving up the ladder as we went and um, moved to Thornton's in, in a search and affiliates position, effectively. Yeah. So, you know, kind of almost taking a sideways step. So I went from global marketing, global digital marketing manager to search and affiliates, but in a much larger industry, in a much larger organization. So that was a very conscious decision to move horizontally and rather than vertically into a bigger industry. And then just over time, that naturally developed. So it started just with search and then affiliates got added on and then all of a sudden CRM got added on and then all of a sudden it was into the full marketing stack effectively. And then Ferrero acquired Thornton's and again, that whole world you know, exploded and got bigger. 
that then led to you know more career progression. Um, so then moved into kind of a digital marketing position. Then it became digital marketing with commercial. And this is where some of the commercial elements yeah. started to add in, and some of the technical elements. And then, you know, more recently, then into a, a, the next level of, of positioning. It's definitely quite impressive. Isn't it's, it? it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, looking back on it, kind of there's, there's so many individual steps that you go. It all makes sense. It's all part of the journey. When you're in that journey, you don't necessarily see it. So it's only now retrospectively looking, you go, that was really important at that moment in time and, and learning those things. Um, it, it is the journey that you, go, that you go on. For perhaps anyone who's thinking of entering the industry, like how important do you think the computer science is, the, the, the ability to, to program? I, the biggest learning from computer science was the way of thinking, not necessarily the fact that, you know, ironically said to the team today, I've got 15 year old knowledge of C++. Don't use it at all, and hopefully you won't have to. Well, you can build um, your MySpace page. Yeah, again, maybe, so, yeah. maybe yeah, build the next MySpace, that'd be yeah. okay. Um, the big, so yeah, the, the, the way of thinking, and it's almost that, for those who know software engineering, it's that debugging mentality of what's the problem, take it step by step to understand what's gone wrong and then fix that specific point. Does it work? No, go back. That mindset, I would say, was more important for me to understand than the language itself. And I think it's a universal thing within computer science and software engineering. And so is, is that not necessarily something you specifically look for on CVs now then? Are you looking for something slightly different when you're bringing in either a junior or mid-weight? Or... Absolutely, yeah. So it, it's definitely, you know, they need, they need to show, depending on the role, a certain level of skill and experience, either within an organisation or multiple organisations. The CV gets you so far and gives you some of that information, but it definitely doesn't show you the will side of it so it will absolutely show the skill and that's kind of the first criteria but then when you've got the person sat in front of you within a few minutes you'll understand the will to and you know if they're applying for a role they've got a certain amount of will and I've had the full spectrum of people who are there because they just want more money <laughs> all the way through to people who really want to push themselves and progress and probably are applying for a job that's slightly out of their comfort zone but why would you apply for a job that's within your comfort zone and you can do with your, with your eyes closed those kind of checks, I think, are more important than the skill that's shown on a CV. How important is it, even in an early point of your career, to, to be going out and finding those people? And, and what should people be looking for? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I still talk now, uh, you know, I've just spoke about kind of that year in Loughborough, single most transformative year of my life, hands down, kind of pointed me in the direction that, 10, 15 years on, I'm still on, on the journey of. So having a mentor and a proper mentor, not just someone who is kind of there to mentor, really important. The flip side of that, now kind of having mentored, um, it's the single most rewarding thing that I do. Yeah. Um, and, and I've mentored people in, in various positions who, you know, we've mentored and then we've gone separate ways and we've just happened to get back in touch I think in one case maybe eight years later and she is now mentoring her own kind of set of people and, and has you know very kindly said that I have pointed her in that direction and and so the mentorship that I received it feels like I've passed it on yeah. and and you know genuinely it's the most rewarding thing that I that I do you know numbers and commercial results and and all of that is brilliant but the fact that you've kind of transformed or you know probably you know, egotistical, but kind of in, helped somebody on their journey, on their career journey is, is super important. Mentoring you know, is definitely, definitely up there in terms of top things. My, my, kind of my pinpoint on that would be not to confuse it with coaching, which I hear a lot of people use mentorship and coaching in the same kind of um, language. I've been coached as well, which is something completely different. And if I was to summarize the two, mentoring is somebody telling you what you might want to do coaching is asking somebody questions so coaching was another i think it was about 10 sessions i did kind of early on in the thorntons days and was equally transformational in terms of asking probing questions and then you sit there and you think yeah it's a really good question and then having to answer it but it's not necessarily work related it's yeah. it it sounds 
crazy, but it's like, you know, going back to like childhood and asking questions which inform how you do things today. That also, I think anyone who gets the opportunity to be coached, properly coached, um, 100% take up the opportunity because it will, it will open your eyes to why you do things and potentially make you do them differently as well. You moved into um, Thorntons, obviously, which then became Ferrero, and you've done a very decent stint there at the moment. What do you, th what's been the kind of like the core reason for, for staying there? What's been kind of the thing that's enabled you to, 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 to grow up? Because it sounds like there's been lots of growth at that company, which is... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th there's two things. The one is, is there still potential to go further from a business perspective? So are we kind of at the pinnacle of where we want to be? No. So is there room to keep going? Is there that progression from a business standpoint there's got to be that otherwise you're just looking to sustain the same level which is a different set of challenges and probably would lead to the same level of, of um, duration there but I think that's really important is do you see what the future business roadmap looks like and is it exciting because that will keep people sticking around if they think there's a real you know I call it CV worthy roadmap mm. and if there is then that will go a long way the other side of that is so that's the business side. The personal side is, am I still learning things? And am I still being challenged to think about, you know, whatever it may be in a different way? If I was there and I knew absolutely everything and I could do it with my eyes closed, being frank, it would be boring. Yeah. Right? You could have a really exciting, you could have a really exciting roadmap, but if you think, oh, I could do all of that tomorrow, is it exciting? And do you want, you know, that whole get out of bed? Do you want to get out of bed? And do you want to work on a Sunday when you have to? Probably not if you've not got an exciting roadmap and it's not challenging you to, to be, you know, to think about those things. And in order for things to be exciting, if you don't know them, you've, again, you've got to have that will to, and that drive to say, I want to learn that. I'll take the cardboard example. You know, I'm not a cardboard expert. I don't know about different packaging materials and different types of packaging or fulfillment in its, in, its, in its general sense. And so the opportunity that continues to present itself in terms of learning some of that stuff is, is exciting because you get to learn new things. And, and if I knew it all, it would probably be easier. Mm. Um, but it probably would miss some of that spark that allows you to, to kind of say, right, OK, how am I going to tackle this? How am I going to pull on different levers within a large organisation, a very large organisation, cross-matrix organisation as well, like Ferrero, how am I going to continue to develop myself, really? That's, that's what it comes down to is, you know, the old adage of every day is a school day. I know it's really cliche, <laughs> but fundamentally, if every day isn't a school day, what's in it for you? It you can know? stagnate, it exactly. can get boring and stuff. So, so like key takeaways for, for, for me there are, you know, you need to find an organization or be within an organization that is growing is or at least growing in terms of its, its opportunities yeah. and you need to tie that in with the mentality of like i need to keep progressing and learning and developing myself and and if the two are there and available you yeah. you're likely to hang around yeah. those two things tie together and then the, the other thing that i should mention as well is again i've referenced a couple of books by the same chap so he's worth he's worth name dropping with simon Sinek. Yeah. Um, so he's done all of this eat, leaders eat last kind of thing, and that's the whole um, the whole piece that I've spoke about. But also that starting with why. So a business will have a reason for being, and an individual will have a reason for being. And if those two things marry up, you're away because you're you're fighting the same cause. You know the same just cause. He talks about a lot. So that overlaid on top of those two kind of business trajectory and also individual learning opportunity they push they kind of they all synchronize together and you know make it a, a factor of why would you move there's yeah. always pull factors from other organizations there's always push factors within any business you know be it small or large i think you always just need to weigh those two things up is there is something else pulling me away and am i being pushed and if the answer to those is no and you've got you've got the right things there then okay. i think it's a it's a winner for you, what role should purpose play in, in the organisation that, that you're in? Like, I think it's super important. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be the exact same purpose. So my purpose in life isn't to sell chocolate and make people happy <laughs> necessarily. Like yeah, 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 true. Yeah, eat it maybe. Um, but it, it's important that you at least resonate with it and you believe in it. You know, if if it was a different industry, and there's been offers that have come to me and said, would you move, you know, same kind of opportunity, same opportunity to learn and for business trajectory. 
but either the product is not as appealing or the reason, the purpose not being quite the same. If you don't resonate with it as much, you kind of get that feeling in your gut as to whether it's the right thing for you to do or not. And there could be you know, a stronger financial package, there could be a higher position or a better job title, which people seem to really care about. Um, but if the purpose isn't is it at least giving you that warm, fuzzy feeling, then I think it's really important that you take a long, hard look at that and, and understand if it's the right thing to do or not. It's, di it's difficult to get out of bed every day for something that you don't believe in or buy into, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it, it helps that the products that we make are, you know, world class. That, that definitely helps. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a really important factor as well. You've got to believe in the product. You've got to believe in the business. You've got to believe in the, you know, hopefully all the people but have that same belief and it just makes things a little bit more easy to do. What, one of the, the last sort of talking points I want to kind of um, focus on is, is the age old balance of, you know, agency or in-house. You, you're a, a person that's obviously succeeded through working and focusing on <clears throat> on the in-house side of things, like what what are the benefits do you see of working in-house, and, and have you ever been lured over to the to the agency side? I, yeah, I mean, I've I've been lured. It's it's a you're right. It's a thing that I've not done, and kind of in my, in my heart of heart, I've got this long tick list of things that I want to do. Maybe packaging wasn't always one of them. It is now, um, and you know, I think that's a that would be really exciting. Um, some of the benefits of working in-house is, I think you feel like you're right at the the coal edge, if you will. So you're, you know the intricate details of that business, that specific business. Hopefully, uh, if you're in the right business and you've got the right people, it will feel like it's almost your business. And so I think that, again, helps. If you feel really close to the business, then it feels like there's more than just driving a commercial you know, opportunity and benefit for the business. It feels like you're... You know, Again, you, you cut somebody open and they have the business in the middle of them. I think that's something that you get from, a, from an in-house perspective. You have the opportunity to be really close to, very, you know, in a cross-matrix organisation, then I see an opportunity where you can go to different people, and especially something, you know, a business the size of Ferrero, you can go to people in the UK, you can go to people kind of at a group level and really get that insight. And there's super knowledgeable people about Ferrero, within Ferrero, obviously, as they would be with any business. So there's some of the, some of the benefits. Um, some, of the, some of the challenges, I guess, to, to balance that out, you can't always move as quickly as you perhaps could if you're employing agency people in to do some of those things. Uh, sometimes you're slightly more restricted by what you can, can and can't do, but that's by nature of being closer to that business and knowing kind of how that business operates. Um, I can't talk in, in terms of what the benefits and challenges are from an agency side, but certainly, that, you know, from my perspective, there's, there's definite benefits. There's de also definitely benefits of having an agency network supporting that business, because again, it gives you a little bit of balance of, you know, best of both worlds. From your perspective, like, what makes a good agency brand partnership, and, and kind of like, how do you find managing those agencies? I think, yeah. I, I, they're really, really important when you have a small agile. You need you need a small agile team because you can kind of you can peak and trough agency support and you can kind of bring it in and be a little bit more aggressive with some of those areas. There's definitely a piece of, you know, for longevity, the agency needs to be on the same wavelength and you know, speaking from experience, needs a certain resilience, as I'm sure yeah. you guys know. <laughs> um, and, and the reason for it will be the agency will come up with 10 brilliant ideas and pass them over to the in-house team. You know, I'm, I'm saying this from the in-house side, yeah. pass over 10 brilliant ideas and, and nine and a half of them will get rejected because, yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever reason. Um, I think there needs to be that real transparency and that honesty there and from, from in-house to agency and vice versa, that that is part of the mission is come up with a thousand good ideas of which half of one will make it through to kind of the, the public eye with that comes again that agility that that honesty i think being really close or asking you know asking the agency to be as close as possible to the business means that there's less filtering of those ideas required there's always going to be some of course um and then on the flip side of that i guess you know 
push, pushing a challenge to an agency. So from an in-house side, pushing a challenge to an agency and saying, you know, we've got this challenge. Can you come up with a thousand really good ideas of how we could potentially resolve it? Hopefully that's really exciting for the agency because they've then got a creative freedom. So that does work, you know, it works both ways. But being really transparent, I think um, certainly kind of, you know, touch wood, getting post-COVID world, having that relationship with the agencies that builds over time, just as you would an in-house team. I think that's critical. Um, oversharing to the agencies and, and vice versa, having you know account managers or kind of um, agency side teams in the same meetings, I think is really something that we've introduced that's really important as well, because it makes it feel like just part of a bigger team rather than these guys work for these guys. It, you know, all again back to that purpose all fighting that same purpose get the guys in the same team meeting so that you're having a really joined up conversation they're not hearing get third hand fourth hand which then makes the ideas require more filtering all of those kind of things lead to a relationship which builds up a common understanding that leads to longevity and kind of you know over time if you, if you had to give advice to yourself, so obviously back in now 2001 in, in the days, what, what sort of advice would you give yourself to, to turbocharge your career? Yeah, I think, I think there's three. There's three things, and I, I've been thinking about this before this, this, this kind of catch-up. So the first would 100% be be willing and comfortable failing. And again, I, I really don't like the term failing. Um, and, you know, there's been career-defining moments where I've you know, sent emails out to a... 100,000 people and they've said Google yeah exactly and, and you think oh that, that wasn't you know my finest hour but you learn more from that moment than you do when it all goes well because you guys going oh, easy when it doesn't work you learn a lot more so that would be the first one you know be happy to fail and, and fail fast tied into that is just become an obsessive learner so if you can't if you can't do something you know I see this all the time with 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 my mum sorry um where she she can't get the sky remote to work she goes, picks up the phone john sky remote doesn't work rather than again sorry rather than how do i fix that problem how do i learn and you know most people have now got the internet so maybe not she can um she can go in and she can find out what's broken fix it and then she knows it and then next time it happens she's got the information and so failing fast really important and then just learning everything, almost never, almost never saying, I, that's not my skill set at all, I don't know that. That will broaden you out. And that's probably the key reason that I've ended up in a, a, more, a wider kind of general position. Those two. And then the third one, again, goes back to that behave for the role that you want and always be looking at the next step on. So, you know, the old adage of, you know, being three steps ahead in the game of chess, you know, always kind of thinking, what's next? What's next for me personally what's next for the business and how do I behave and how do I operate to get there that would that's something that I've definitely advocated with anyone that will listen for, for for that as well I don't think you can get too much better advice than that <laughs> that's that's amazing I can't thank you enough for that and if anyone wants to find you on on socials where would they go yeah LinkedIn um John Alexander Rowley probably best place you search me up you should see um a couple of photos on there by all means, you know, I always, always advocate people to follow and, and let's have a chat, you know, for anything, really. I'm more than happy to talk. As you know. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for watching. For more content like this, don't forget to sign up to our newsletter, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social.